celebrating 41 seasons on the air. Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Span. And I'm Amy Myers. Thanks for joining us today on Farm Week and what a show it is. That's right, Amy. First, we'll be looking at how the new tax law may benefit farmers. And later, find out whether it's corn or soybeans that could win the ongoing acreage battle this spring. And later, there's even a tip for eating healthier and a festival. That's all straight ahead. Accountants and other experts have had about a month to figure out exactly what the new tax rules signed into law in Washington in December could mean for farmers and agribusinesses. Peter Tubbs tells us about one immediate bonus farmers can count on and goes over some of the other important details. Changes to the federal tax structure put in motion by President Trump's signature last December will not only affect purchases that farmers and ranchers make in 2018, but could also affect who they sell their grain to. According to many tax accountants, the immediate bonus for farmers will be an allowance for the full depreciation of equipment purchased after September 27th of 2017. Full depreciation will be allowed for the next five years until being phased out in 2026. Used equipment is also eligible for the deduction. Additionally, the new law allows joint households to deduct 20% of pass-through income below $315,000. Anything above that mark will require additional calculations. The deduction limit has been doubled to $1 million per year, and that limit phases out as operations reach a $2.5 million cap. To avoid returning to these reset limits, both numbers are now indexed to inflation. An obscure corner of the tax code saw one deduction repealed, only to be replaced with another. The Domestic Production Activities Deduction, or DPAD, also known as Section 199, has been replaced with Section 199A. DPAD was originally designed to encourage domestic manufacturing, but was used mostly by software and entertainment companies. For agriculture, DPAD allowed cooperatives to deduct 9% of their taxable income and pass shares of the deduction to their members. The new Section 199A allows for a 20% deduction for grain sales to a cooperative by its members. Depending on the producer's tax bracket, the deduction could result in reducing their burden from 5 to 20 cents per bushel. Private grain buyers like Cargill or ADM are concerned access to crops will become more difficult. Congress may attempt to adjust the terms of the deduction to remove the incentive, which could trigger a 60-vote minimum for passage in the Senate. No Democrats voted for the tax plan when it passed along party lines in late December. Friday, the USDA stated that the benefit is an unintended consequence of the new tax law and has asked Congress to address the loophole in the current session. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. December was also when Farm Bureau named the winner of the Young Farmer and Rancher Achievement Award in Mississippi. The award went to David A. Rand of LaFleur County, a fourth generation row crop farmer in the Delta. His grandfather, Hugh A. Rand Sr., was Farm Bureau president for 16 years until 1988. You know, my grandfather was a past president. Just being up here on the stage to represent my family and then to be able to represent Farm Bureau in Nashville is just a huge honor for us and we're, we're so thankful for this opportunity. Um, you know, when Rebecca and I moved back to the Delta in 2012, we really had no idea that, you know, Farm Bureau and the Young Farmer and Rancher, or the, at least the Young Farmer and Rancher program even existed. And, you know, Britton Hatcher got us involved in the wife and our program. And, you know, thanks to uh, Samantha Laird and President Mike McCormick, you know, this, this, the wife and our program is growing and the wife and our program has helped us grow immensely. Whether it's the Delta, the hills, or towards the coast, have you ever wondered what life might have been like 150 years ago in the Mississippi city or town where you live? Well, the recent Piney Woods Heritage Festival in Picayune offers a trip back in time 
for a glimpse of daily life. Held at Mississippi State University's Crosby Arboretum, the event features activities like metalworking, quilting, basket making, and even children's activities. With a variety of activities demonstrating early life and cultures, the Piney Woods Heritage Festival tells the story of those who came before us. Here you can learn about spinning wool into yarn, the art of quilting and hand stitching fabric, the history of native Indian tribes, various types of woodworking, creating handmade baskets, and much more. We offer a lot in the way of traditional skills and demonstrations of the rural and, and uh, farm uh, type of lifestyle. I think people will come away with a deeper appreciation for the history of their area and the region. It deepens the understanding of, of the last several hundred years and the settlement of this area. There's something for everybody today. We have the Choctaw dancers, the Choctaw social dancers. One of the interesting uh, surprise favorites was the Morse code demonstration because a lot of the military, uh, former military, have come up to that display. My favorite part of this event today was seeing how they made butter. The difference between the butter we get at the store and the butter I made today was at first when you make the butter you make today, you have no flavor in it when you try it, but then you have to add salt to make it have flavor. I think I'll like the kind I made today because I made it. I like the blacksmithing. I like it. It's really fun and I like to see them when they do all the stuff. It's really neat. I always want to see one of the spinning wheels and how it worked and it was really cool to see how she was spinning the spinning wheel because the wool was on there and then the wool turned into yarn and I was like wow that's neat and I like to sew too so I really liked that a lot. There were children's activities on site at the festival and handmade items were available for sale. The festival also featured performing arts with various types of dancing and music for folks of all ages to enjoy. From the Crosby Arboretum in Picayune, Mississippi, I'm Amy Myers reporting. Well, just as sure as death and taxes, the month of January usually means that a lot of folks are trying to start eating healthier with the goal of losing weight for the new year. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Extension's Natasha Haynes says the simple act of keeping a food diary can encourage you to eat fewer calories and keep yourself motivated. And now it's time for Daily Food Journaling with Natasha. Dear Diary, keeping up with what I eat every day is a challenge. If I don't write it down right away, I usually forget. So I think I'm going to try one of those food journal apps on my phone. Wow, that was easier than I thought. Dear Diary, apparently I'm going to have to go get my vision checked. I've been eyeballing my portion sizes for years, but when I switched over to actually measuring my food, huh, I found out what I thought was a half a cup of pasta was a whole lot of pasta. Dear Diary, I've always heard that losing weight is all about the math, but I didn't really believe it until I saw all the calories stacking up from snacking. I'm figuring out that fruits and vegetables can fill me up without adding a whole lot of calories. Dear Diary, major breakthrough this week. I have learned that I feel better when I don't eat a lot of fried foods. My stomach doesn't hurt and I have way more energy throughout the day. Can you believe it? It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says, no matter whether you use a notebook, a smartphone app, or simply an index card in your pocket to keep track of what you're eating, keeping a food diary can help you take an honest look at your eating habits. Certainly a good practical tip there and adding a little exercise along the way doesn't hurt either for sure. That's right. Well, let's check in on the markets. Well, we have a big price drop at catfish ponds compared to a year ago. Also ahead, there are no bears in sight as cotton prices enjoy a great start to the year. And the acreage battle between corn and soybeans continues. Let's take a look at what happened in December as far as U.S. catfish. 
U.S. producers received a pond bank price of $1.04 per pound for premium size live fish. That is 15 cents per pound less than the price they got in December of 2016. Farm sales totaled 25 and a half million pounds round weight, a drop of 8% from the year before, and processor sales were just over 12 million pounds for the month of December. Well, the gradual process of building U.S. beef export business in China continues. In addition to educating consumers there about U.S. beef, Extension's Josh Maple says there are steps that will have to take place here on U.S. farms as well if this is to be a success. So I think it's going about like we expected. This is going to be a gradual process. We, we Markets have to develop both for U.S. beef in China, uh, consumers actually purchasing it, uh, but they also have to develop for the cattle here that uh, meet the requirements for uh, beef to be exported to China. So we're going to, th that's going to be a gradual process getting both of those markets to, uh, to evolve and, and to what's required to see a lot more beef shipped to China. Well, time now for our trivia quiz on Farm Week. And this week, it's about an important commodity for Mississippi, sweet potatoes. Here is the question, what sweet potato variety is planted by a majority of Mississippi growers? Is the answer A, Evangeline, B, O'Henry, C, Bonita, or D, Beauregard? We'll have that answer coming up. We're going to pause for a short break, but don't go anywhere. Still ahead, the world's shortage of quality cotton continues to propel prices higher. And later, a statewide network of trained volunteers is ready for the upcoming garden season. Master gardeners work alongside extension agents to answer homeowners' questions. The volunteers have been an important part of horticulture education in Mississippi for over 25 years. I've taken a lot of hits on the football field, but nothing has ever hit me as hard as cancer. I'm Dak Prescott, and my mom died from colon cancer in 2013. I live every day thinking about the way she hurt. So be there for the ones you love and talk to your doctor about getting screened for colon cancer. Before we get back to the rest of the markets, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. Mississippi State Extension is hosting a row crops educational meeting in Macon in East Central Mississippi on Monday, February 5th. The meeting will cover weed control strategies as well as potential disease and insect issues for 2018. Agronomists will also have presentations on soybeans, corn, and cotton. It takes place at the Nogsby County Civic Center on Highway 45 in Macon from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. The 45th Annual Conference of the Mississippi Agricultural Consultants Association is taking place February 6th and 7th in Starkville. Sessions will include maximizing cotton yields, use of growth regulations in peanuts, and issues with dicamba. Where do we go from here? There will also be a full exhibit area. Location is the, lo is the Boss Extension Center on the MSU campus. The program begins at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, February 6th. Well, it was about a month ago that cotton prices really began to climb, and it's been a great January market so far. Trader Lewis Rose says January rarely holds the high price for new crop. Highs more often come, he says, during planting season. And OA Cleveland comments he's unable to find bearishness in this market. Now, Trader Dan Huber seems to be a little more pessimistic, meanwhile, at this point when talking about cotton. I think we're probably to the point where we're squeezing the final bears out of this market. Uh, once we get above 80 cents here, I think it's going to be a little, di little bit difficult to keep sustaining the market, particularly now I think you're going to start hearing talk, well, this is going to be a good market to start de deferring acreage into yeah. if we're going to lose a few soybeans and uh, it, it, however, we, however we make that mix into the spring. But, you know, at this point, you've, you've actually given the incentive to start increasing that cotton acreage again, at, which ought to kind of put a cap on this. Meanwhile, a battle for planted acres is taking place between soybeans and corn. Extension's Brian Williams has an update on that 
right after he reviews the mid-month USDA crop update. What shape is the soybean market in based on the ag supply demand report? Well, overall, the report was a little bit mixed for soybeans. On the one hand, um, supplies were reduced a little bit because of a, a lower yield. It was lowered from 49.5 bushels per acre to 49.1. But on the other hand, uh, uh, demand was, was down a little bit. Um, so uh, crush was reduced slightly, and then our um, exports were reduced by 65 million bushels, which brought uh, any stocks uh, up by 25 million bushels, which was was a little less than ideal for the markets. A lot of analysts seem to be saying demand is what's carrying the soybean market right now. Is that kind of contradictory to the numbers you're talking about? At, at first glance, it could be, especially with that big reduction in exports. But at the end of the day, relative to years past, demand has been real strong. Um, one number economists like to talk about is the stocks to use ratio, which is basically a measure of um, how much is being demanded versus how much is being supplied. And that number is still staying fairly strong. So as a, as a overall, demand is, is still staying fairly, fairly strong for soybeans. Now, what about the corn market? Basically bearish looking at this report? Yeah, corn really took a hit from this. Uh, the big, big news on the corn front was a reduction in yields by one, or, or an increase in yields by 1.2 bushels per acre. Um, most analysts weren't expecting it to be uh, increased at all. Most were expecting it to stay steady, so that was really a shock. What kind of picture do these numbers paint as far as potential planted acreage for Mississippi in the Mid-South this year? Well, there's kind of a battle going on for those acres right now. Um, with soybean demand staying fairly strong relative to corn with the high supplies in corn, um, things seem to be favoring uh, soybeans a little bit. Uh, but with that being said, nationally, we're, we are expecting more corn acres to be planted this year. Um, but a lot of it's gonna come down to individual producer profitability for those crops. Back to the trivia quiz now as we wrap things up here in the markets. Today's question, it was about Mississippi sweet potatoes and the sweet potato variety planted by a majority of Mississippi growers is Beauregard. D is the right answer. Well, even though it's the middle of winter, lots of homeowners are fantasizing about the beginning of spring. Why, you ask? Well, because it means they can grow in the yard again and work there, and for many, plant a garden. For over a quarter century now, the Master Gardener Organization has been on the front line of helping extension offices answer the flood of questions that naturally pour in when folks get out in the yard again. Master Gardeners are volunteers who are trained and certified in all things related to home horticulture. They help extension agents disseminate research-based gardening information through a variety of activities that reach both young and old alike. And Farm Week recently traveled to DeSoto County to meet a veteran Master Gardener volunteer who is more passionate than ever about serving and educating others. When I came, uh, I, one of the, the questions that they had on the application was uh, why do you want to be a master gardener? And I said, well, I've been digging in the dirt. I want to, I want to find out what I've been digging for. It was 15 years ago that Betty Pruitt signed up to become a master gardener volunteer in DeSoto County. Her only regret about that today is that she didn't do it sooner. Betty's mentor on this journey is Extension Service County Coordinator, Joy Anderson. I would say that Betty's kind of unusual in She's one of my success stories that uh, when she started the program and I told her, you know, there's the educational component, she flat out told me, I'll never speak in front of a group of people. And now you can't shut her up. Master Gardener volunteers like Betty Pruitt are the right hand of county agents when it comes to questions about home gardens. They are highly trained and help county extension offices reach a much broader audience with research proven horticulture information. Well, it allows me to do a whole lot more education in the county. Um, one person, it's really hard. We're in one of the largest counties population-wide in the state. Um, I think the last figure the was 100. Growing, yeah, 167,000 people, and I'm one horticulture agent. And so in order for me to, to really make an impact, you have to have that volunteer base that's helping you get out in the community and, and doing horticulture 
program so that people know how to take care of their home garden. And that frees me up to be able to do other things, like working with the commercial folks. We get to be able to see other people's gardens and, and be able to interact with some other people in the community, which is great. And then when we do our library lecture series and people come, you know, you'll start off on one topic, but then the question period comes and it just goes off on all the different things. So sometimes a 20 minute talk may end up an hour and the people are still asking questions. That makes you feel so good when you do that. It's really great. Across the parking lot from the DeSoto County Extension Office is a garden where Betty Pruitt and other Master Gardener volunteers in the county receive their first hands-on training in horticulture. It's known here as the Learning Garden. Not every county is able to have a teaching resource like this. This garden is also a certified Monarch Butterfly way station. They've uh, planted a lot of butterfly weed. That's what this flower is over there that, uh, that you saw the, uh, the caterpillar on. Uh, up in the uh, up in the butterfly garden area, up in the woods, you're go you'll see some of the little um, the casings that the, that the uh, butterfly is going to emerge from. I was hoping maybe today that y'all would actually see see one emerge, but they're a little sleepy or tired or whatever, so maybe not. As with 4-H, you learn by doing. It's much better when they can get out here and actually do what needs to be done and see it being done than just giving them a piece of paper and saying, you know, read this and do this. Right. So it works a whole lot better. In exchange for 40 hours of training, each Master Gardener volunteer like Betty Pruitt is certified and volunteer to return 40 hours of service to their communities within one year. I know that the first year I was scared to death. How in the world am I going to get 40 hours in? and I got 104 in that year. So, and it sort of climbs up and down, you know, but usually somewhere around 100 hours a year. One of Betty Pruitt's first volunteer projects after being certified was being involved in a plant camp for children. She still looks forward to that event each year. We do a plant camp every year for, we keep it at 30 so that we can, we can corral them because sometimes they'll start out sort of shy on a Monday. By Wednesday, it's like herding cats. You gotta, you gotta sort of keep up with them. That's, that's the fun time when you see those kids learning and their eyes are brightening up. This year we had uh, a little boy that got to be a beekeeper. He put his suit on and got to do with the bees and things. I mean, those, yeah, those are, yes. That's, that's what makes a master gardener glad she's a master gardener. The volunteers are required to receive continuing education along the way. To remain certified in the program, master gardeners attend 12 hours of training and return 20 hours of volunteer service each year following their first one. For Betty, as you heard earlier, meeting the minimum has never been a problem. The opportunities to serve are many and also varied, and she enjoys every one of them. We have a Master Gardener hotline here that we man during the springtime. We've also, uh, on Saturdays, we go to Farmer's Market down there at uh, Hernando. And uh, we have, it's called Ask the Master Gardener, where we give out pamphlets, but people bring us all sorts of stuff. And sometimes, uh, Joy will say, oh, could you go out to such and such house uh, and, and check on this uh, garden problem that they've got. And so we'll go do that. And once I've got them trained, if I get a call and I think it's the right kind of call, I'll call them and say, I need you to go and see this person about their problem. And I explain to them what's going on and I make sure that they have the tools that they need to go out and do that home visit, whether it's publications or um, clippers to get samples so that we can send it off if they need to. Agents describe the Master Gardener Volunteer Program as a great way to gain horticulture expertise while meeting other avid gardeners and getting connected to the community. Volunteer Betty Pruitt doesn't see any downside, no matter your background, your age, or your education. Do you know, I don't think there's a person that wouldn't enjoy it once they got in. We've had people that were a little timid about going, coming into us saying, oh, well, I don't know anything about horticulture, so I can't do this. If you 
like to go out and pull weeds or look at flowers or dig in the dirt. It doesn't matter. We've got doctors, we've got lawyers, we've got school teachers, we've got little old people like me that's never done anything. That once you get into the Master Gardening Program, if you care about horticulture at all, or if you don't even know about horticulture, if you just care about gardening and flowers, I'd say jump in with both feet. You won't regret it. It'll, it'll be the best time of your life. From Hernando, Mississippi, I'm Leighton Spann reporting. And there are indeed more than 1,000 Master Gardener volunteers in the state of Mississippi, like Betty Pruitt, and they do an incredible job of increasing Extension's capacity to meet the public demand for all that horticulture information. A lot of volunteer service has been provided over the past 25 years. For example, the Octibaha County Master Gardeners are presenting the Everything Garden Expo in Starkville on March 24th and 25th. And thank you so much for joining us this week. I'm Amy Myers. And I'm Leighton Spann. Remember, if you missed a story, find it and all the past episodes under the Shows tab on our website, extension.msstate.edu. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to join in on the conversation. We'll see you next week.